Welcome, everyone. My name is Tony. We want to thank you all for joining us and being part of the webinar today. Um, this is our third episode, and it's called The Link. Um, we're excited to have such an awesome music industry panel with us today. We want to say hi to all our viewers as well. Thanks for tuning in. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of Jam Compass, which is a mobile app that will be in beta in the next couple months. And it will allow creatives and music industry professionals the ability to connect, collaborate, and find opportunities in real time. Um, so while we're finishing development, we wanted to start bringing the music community together and discussing where things are headed within the industry um, with all that's going on. So continuing from last week's discussion, our topic will be music in times of pandemic. And we invited you all here to give us your thoughts and how you're dealing with it um, within your sector of the industry. Um, before we get started, for all the viewers tuning in, um, you can introduce yourself in the chat section, say hi, say whatever, you know, and um, in the Q&A section, uh, if you have questions for the panelists, you can post your questions there and we'll get to them near the end. And uh, now I'm going to pass it on to Anthony, my partner in Jam Compass. Hey guys, thanks, uh, thanks to the panelists for being on episode three. We really appreciate um, everyone's time. Um, we all know everyone's really busy even though we're going through a pandemic, there's a lot of great stuff going on in the music business um, and a lot of things that are changing and adapting. So um, we're gonna go around, everyone, you know, we'll start with the BB, um, introduce yourself, tell us the background um, and how, how the pandemic has, um, you know, changed, changed uh, your sector in, um, especially with Circle House and in the studio world. Uh, you know, from Circle House Studios, also a BB Lewis from a BB marketing and branding. Uh, I come from the background of reggae music. Uh, my father is in the group Inner Circle. They made the theme song for Cops, uh, Bad Boys, and the, and the movie with Martin Lawrence and Will Smith. Also, um, another big record that we have out is called Sweat, Girl, I'm Gonna Make You Sweat, that um, a lot of along that Shakira just redid also right now with Unwell, that's tearing up Latin music. So. I'm um, just like here in Miami, I got my marketing company and, you know, um, we've just been a hub here for a very long time. Uh, my little brother's Lunch Money, who's also a singer, songwriter, artist also. And um, yeah, that's about it right now, you know. Awesome, man. Yeah, so, I mean, it's coming from, um, you know, Circle House and being like one of the most popular studios in Miami and, and I think one of the dopest in the country. Um, how's everything been for you guys during this time? Well, like um, the studio, like world in a whole has been kind of like slowed down. You know, artists are now doing stuff at their house. Artists like it kind of like they've been doing it. So you kind of got to get more. It's really been like writing camps, you know, it's really been really been the forefront uh, of the artistry right now. So uh, we've always been in the transition of change. So in the whole studio business, we're, we're in the transition of going into like online mixing uh, and mastering. Uh, we're in the transition of doing more like virtual studio stuff, uh, almost stuff like this webinar orientated and, um, you know, some songwriter like uh, in studio stuff that we got going on. But uh, in this time and age, it's, 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 it's hard to say people are still recording, I should say. You know, people are still out there. They, they slow down for a second, but people are definitely still recording music. They're still trying to be creative. They're still trying to come up with that hit record and different things. It kind of slowed down a tad bit, but it's kind of like speeding back up a little bit now. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, as far as like everything that you guys do from um, even on the standpoint of like being around, you know, your father with such an iconic band. I mean, you know, I had the privilege of working with you guys. You know, you guys gave me my first job in the business. Um, yeah. And, you know, we had, it's crazy, like, looking back and, and the people that we, you know, were around at the studio then, Ben Billions, even your brother Lunch, I mean. Um, yeah, you, you saw the rise of those people and you saw, you saw Ben, yeah. you know, starting out as an intern like yourself and propelling himself to the next level, you know? Yeah, so it's been, it's been really dope um, just kind of seeing everyone's progress um, from where we started at Circle House. Um, and, you know, anything you can, you can, t you know, tell people too about, you know, songs that like bad boys and all these things that get in sync that, that literally like, you know, 
had a big factor. In yeah, well, definitely, the definitely. Video, the sync you know? game is serious because also one of my clients is the Two Live Crew. You know, I work with uh, Joseph Weinberg, who actually owns the Two Live Crew catalog. And man, the sync game, the sample game, um, the people are redoing records like crazy. But you know, you got to be able to own your music. You know, you got to be able to have those songs. And us being here in Miami, it's a great hub because it's so Spanish, it's so American, it's so Jamaican, it's so it's so everything culture. So a song, uh, let me give you an example. Um, we got a song called "Lovers and Friends" by um, Michael Sterling, right? Mm -hmm. um, that catalog uh, was purchased by somebody, you know, that song. And since that, that song has been redone twice. Khaled did it over with Do You Mind, and then Pitbull did it over with Que La Servor. I, I don't know if I'm saying it properly, but I was just showing you how that song, an R&B urban song done over first by Usher and Ludacris and Little John, then 10 years later, Khaled, and then right after that, Pitbull, Prince Royce, and Ludacris, you know? So it's like Miami's just that hub, but you know, you gotta be able to own your music. You gotta have the connection to the producer. You gotta have the connection to the songwriter. You gotta have that connection, you know? And, and you, you being around Circle House, you know how we do things different, how we, you know, it was just a different, different way we teach, you know, different way we market, different way we, you know, get at these, these, these celebrities and these artists and get, get to befriend them, be cool with them, you know? Absolutely, man. It was, I mean, I was there for a couple of years. It was a legendary time back then. So, I mean, it's been, it's been like that for, you know, over a decade now, two decades. Yeah, now. but you, you came in at a good time, man. You came in at a very good time. All right, let's move over to Rebecca. Hi, guys. Hey. Um, just, like, give me, the, give me the, full, the full prompt again. Yeah, I mean, just introduce yourself. Um, Oh, yeah, easy. I just know how, how you how you've been kind of maneuvering, uh, how you know you and your company have been maneuvering during everything right now. Well, um, right now we well okay. I'm gonna start off with with what I do. Um, so I've been in the A and R space for the last ten years um, in in publishing mainly as an A and R. Um, and for the last almost five years, I've been at Sal & Co. We're the management company for uh, The Weeknd, French Montana, Doja Cat, um, among many others, including Ben Billions and, and Metro Boomin and, and London on the Track. So we have a lot of clients. Um, but basically what I do for them now is I oversee all the A&R, all the creative. I act like an in-house publishing A&R. Um, making sure everyone's in sessions and getting their songs pitched in TV and film. Um, if we have an album in the works, we have feature opportunities. We work on getting writers and producers together. It's kind of just all encompassing because a lot of our team started out in LA, like from Canada, but they, when they came to LA, they didn't really know the creative scene as much. Um, so that's where I came in and now, um, as a result of it, we've been expanding on the creative side because of all the new clients we have. And now with the pandemic happening and everyone kind of trying to figure out how to move, um, it's definitely shifted how, um, how we do sessions, how we have people collaborate obviously over zoom or um we're doing a lot of beat packs now that we're sending to our artists that we're sending to um, writers producers people to kind of just like collab in isolation um and another thing we've seen change a lot is kind of like you know if you get an opportunity just take it don't like kind of mull it over just take it and see what happens especially if we're getting we're getting like a lot of sync requests now and um in in a lot of ways it's we don't kind of really have the luxury of like oh well let's go back and see how much we can you know how much more we can get it to it's like let's just say yes and keep it moving for now because everyone kind of just wants to keep the conversation of of you know making money uh and not stifling that Definitely. And, you know, uh, The Weekend's album has been number one for the last three weeks. So how, how's that been um, for you guys, too, during all this? And it's been really, really beautiful. Just I mean, I even, like, I was not 
I gotta be honest, I was not expecting like this this much love and this much um, warmth and reception like reception to it. Obviously, we've had to kind of reroute um, tour a little bit differently, and that's kind of still like a thing that's moving and changing right now. Um, and then uh, another thing was, was kind of like, well, how are we going to release this in the middle of a pandemic? Are people still going to respond? Like, how is it going to? And it, honestly, it was divine timing, the way it all kind of panned out, you know, to yeah, be the timing was crazy. Back the eyeballs, you know, at home, just watching and waiting for new music. And, and it's nice to see nice to see music like helping people kind of get through a tough time that's that's really at the core of it that's what's really most important to me yeah i mean when i when i look back on on this pandemic that album is definitely going to be a staple that's for sure i hope so yeah what's your favorite awesome. song off the album um after hours is really dope um I don't know. Like, the singles are great. I mean, I play, I, you know, I've been playing them for a while. Like, you know, nice. um, I mean, everything the weekend does, I'm, I'm personally a fan of. So. Awesome. Um, yeah, let's move over to David. Am I still on mute? Oh, here we go. What up? What's up, David? How are you, man? I'm chilling, man. Thanks for, uh, thanks for being on today. Yeah. Yeah. Introduce yourself. Um, you know, tell tell the audience a little bit of your backstory. Obviously, Mind of a Genius has made major impact in the music industry um, since its birth. So we'd love, definitely love to hear about all that as well. Yeah, well, first of all, nice to meet all you guys on the panel. Um, it's it's, it's kind of cool that we get to be able to do this during the pandemic. So I hate driving around town meeting people. So this is actually best case scenario for me. Um, yep. <laughs> Sort of what I've been up to. So I, I was a DJ for a very long time through like high school and college. And then I transitioned from that to producing my own music, um, which did well in South America. So I toured a ton in like Brazil, Argentina, all over sort of down South for a couple of years into like my mid twenties. Um, I got fucked over by every manager, agent, promoter, like you name it. I, I went through the ringer of being in that system myself um, as an artist for a long time. So that sort of gave me like the landscape and learning that I needed to move forward in my next sort of escapade. And I was always going to stay in music because I've been in music since I was a, a baby almost. Um, and then when I transitioned out of that, I was, you know, I always had the dream of starting an independent label and I worked at a label for a second when I was like 18 or 19. Um, so I, I learned a lot about how most shit doesn't work that label sign. So I was on this sort of, you know, owe to myself to try and sign things that um, I think could make huge impact and just had like this sort of horse blinding focus on breaking into the market with. Um, Skylar actually who's in this chat knows my first artist really well, Zoo. Um, so like my business now specializes in, in finding artists when they are like at their sort of zero to 30% phase. Um, and then refacing, resurfacing, making better music, making the show better, like real hands-on artist development. Um, and then basically bringing back to the market um, in, a, in a new, fresh way. So Zoo is obviously the first success that we had. Um, I like to work my stuff mainly internationally way before. So we have a lot of plugs with like Australian radio and UK radio and German radio and getting our stuff started there because I think naturally this, this type of stuff that I like is not like very down the middle American pop music um, or very much like just straight rap music either. It's sort of is a blend of everything. Um, so th that's sort of where I am now. We're, uh, we were with Warner for a couple of years. We got out of that deal about a year ago. I'm like the happiest I've ever been to be independent and have enough money to just like work on things that I want to work on without having to have a partner behind my neck anymore. Um, so that feels good. I mean, and I think during the quarantine, as long as, I mean, as far as my artists go, we're, uh, everyone's at sort of a different place. So the ones that have already sort of like graduated and I've already had albums come out and touring, um, I think they're finding it harder, like keep a fans engaged because obviously they can't go on tour and do things, you know, 
live in that way. But for my developing artists that are working on making albums, this is like the biggest blessing that could happen to them. Um, cause it gives us like the most time to refine and sort of go back to the music and the videos and the rollout and make sure that we have like the best possible team when launching a project. So yeah, it's, it's been good. I mean, on a, on a personal level, obviously like every day is different, but I think for the most part, I'm trying to focus on the things that I can control, which for developing artists and finding new artists right now, this has been like a great scenario for me. So I'm listening to like new demos almost every day. Um, I'm talking to a lot of kids that I didn't have time to talk to. I'm talking to music supervisors that I didn't have time to talk to before. Um, and I'm just, I'm, I'm really trying to connect with people like people in this chat that like, I just had never had time to connect with because I was always, you know, we, we, all of us were always in this like, go, go, go mode. So I think that this quarantine time has given me personally and my artists like a chance to just really perfect the art before, you know, letting the horse out of the race and then trying to like, you know, go is going that way. So that's sort of what I've been up to. Awesome, man. Yeah, I know. I mean, I've heard some of the to the new act you're developing right now. Really exciting stuff uh, Thanks, come, from, from, from your uh, label for sure. Thank you. Um, all right. Awesome, man. Thank you. Uh, let's move over to uh, to Cameron. What's up, man? Hey, guys. How y'all doing? Uh, you? Good, good, good. I'm all right, man. Yeah, sorry I was in here a little bit late. Had a little trouble with the link, but uh, I appreciate the opportunity for being here, man. Uh, this is definitely, I've never done anything like this before. So again, uh, like I said, similar to David said, this is awesome to be able to do this during the quarantine. So appreciate it. Yeah, man. Thank um, you. But yeah, one, one more time. Go ahead and just run off <laughs> exactly what I need to do. Yeah, yeah. Just introduce yourself. Um, you know, obviously you're working. With, you know, you're working with Triller right now. Um, definitely a major player in um, in the space at the moment. Um, I know you guys just did a big digital festival this past weekend, which I tuned in on personally. Um, yeah, I would love to like, you know, just hear what you guys have going on over there, how you guys have been kind of adapting and obviously throwing the festival was a, was a major uh, step forward for I think a lot of artists right now. Um, and yeah, I mean, tell us, uh, cool. tell us what you think. Yeah, man. Um, so I guess this is, I guess a little background on me. Um, I have been with, Trailer for about three years now so I started fresh out of college with uh, our original uh, founder of the company um, and was doing pretty much a simple content moderation job slash like uh, content curation to the platform so back then the app was really just a video tool um, and unfortunately we actually went under for about nine months after the initial six months since that I was with the company so um, upon coming back uh, with our new finder, or founder uh, or no sorry our new CEO Mike Lou um, I was hired back to do uh, a lot of our music curation um, of the platform and also a lot of the onboarding of influencers to the platform. So uh, at that time, actually, when Mike had asked me to come back onto the company, I had just um, quit my other job, quit my, um, or sorry, sold my uh, car and drove across the country with my best friend and was doing pretty much brand ambassador stuff. So I was really going to music festival shows, conventions, meeting influencers on the fly. Um, and really just introducing people to the app. So um, I think it was interesting just around that time, the way people were discovering Triller was purely through like, you know, the watermark in the videos um, and really just seeing, uh, you know, viral sensations going off on TikTok, uh, sorry, TikTok, uh, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, et cetera. So our little watermark uh, in the corner of those videos allowed us to start really doing uh, a lot of stuff in the industry that people were starting to notice. Um, so my main responsibility for Trillier for the last couple of years has really been driving the trends and the challenges and uh, more the relevant artists that I feel are coming up and really best represent the brand um, and giving them a platform to really thrive on. So like I said, I've been uh, all the playlisting, um, a lot of the videos that you see uh, featured on our community feed, um, kind of understanding better how to curate the content to the platform to best build out promotions and campaigns for the artists um, are really my main job with the company now. So. Um, as my um, title sits right now, I'm the director of music content and artist relations for the company. Um, and again, I guess uh, with what I've been doing recently, uh, a lot of this during this time is, uh, again, just giving more artists, um, you know, the ability and time to kind of sit there, create, and, or now just kind of seeking different opportunities to be able to put themselves out there. Um, so I know, especially... I don't know if you guys have seen a lot of some of these challenges, especially the coronavirus, cha uh, coronavirus challenges that have been going around. One of the artists, uh, there was a kid, uh, Lil Nicks, who I found probably, I think, 
middle of March, uh, and I found his YouTube video to the song, and we put it up in the app, did a challenge to it, reached out to the kid, um, got him to make a profile, and started getting him to uh, push himself. Uh, he's a 15-year-old kid based out of London, uh, but the challenge blew up to the platform. Um, and upon reaching out to him about two weeks later, um, I had a friend of mine who was interested in trying to manage him to see if he had management. Uh, he had just told him that he was getting, you know, calls from Sony, actually, uh, for, you know, I guess for interest. And so we called him another two weeks after that. And he now has a team and he actually big time me uh, to be able to use a song on the platform for a promotion. So it's I've actually had that case study happen. Um, a lot within the last couple months. And what I'm starting to find is that, you know, as we've become more popular, and I think a lot of a lot more trust has been gained in our brand and our identity, um, in terms of just being able to identify trending artists and even trending music, you know, as I think as the labels are starting to use this more as uh, an art tool, my whole responsibility is really um, kind of doing the groundwork and keeping my ear to the ground and kind of collaborating with a lot of the companies and uh, a lot of uh, the platforms in the industry that really, uh, you know, are just trusted sources for, you know, who's up next. And um, the more I'm able to kind of, you know, navigate that, it's been tough with, I think, where we are in our company. So um, we kind of just recently went corporate as of November of last year. Um, so before that, we were six people uh, in an office in Playa Vista. Um, and upon getting acquired, uh, now have about 38 people in an office in, in um, Century City. Um, so that growth for us has been interesting to navigate. And again, it being kind of recent going into the year and then having this all happen. Um, a lot of what we're working on is really just trying to, uh, you know, reorganize ourselves internally. We've brought on a lot of resources. Obviously, we've been fundraising and doing a lot of great things on that end. Um, and so even things such as uh, we just recently hired out a PDC department. <laughs> Sorry. We just recently hired out a PDC department, um, which is really exciting for us to be able to start a shooting uh, original content in-house. So... Um, I don't know if any of you guys have seen on the app, we started doing little things like a mini interview series called Who Is, um, experimented with doing uh, an in-house uh, acoustic um, performance session with Yellow Beezy uh, called Soundcheck. Um, and so those are kind of just different uh, avenues we're looking to explore, I guess, as this has all kind of happened. And I guess one of the things that was interesting, as we mentioned, Triller Fest, uh, we had a whole huge activation plan for Coachella. Um, and so obviously once I got canceled, it was interesting that we all had to kind of pivot and we actually threw Triller Fest together in about three weeks. So I know we got a lot of praise and criticism on both ends for how we should have done it differently or who we should have included and stuff like that. And so it was more so miraculous to us that we managed to actually pull it off in that amount of time. Um, but I think for us, it was one of those things where we realized, you know, we had been neglecting simple things such as, you know, our YouTube presence, right? It was one of those things we decided, hey, we want to do this. And we're like, well, we can't live stream to the platform yet. So, you know, how else are we going to make this happen? So um, it was a lot of ingenuity on our end to kind of, like I said, we, we streamed it through Caffeine, uh, Twitch, and YouTube. And like I said, from the, the amount of time and the amount of artists that we had on there, I think we learned a lot from how we would do it differently going forward. Um, but again, it was a great opportunity for us to just capitalize on what was happening. And again, I think um, even simple things like content requirements, right i think we kind of just uh really opened a lot of people's eyes to what's capable in the space right now given what we're working with so again artists have still access to their creative uh you know resources to do things and again just kind of uh, allowing them a stage or a platform to really put that stuff out there and have it promoted to, again is what everybody's looking to do right now so that was a really great opportunity for us like i said i'm happy you know a couple of you guys tuned in um like i don't know if we're going to be doing another one yet um but uh yeah so uh, I think that was pretty yeah, much so, the rundown for me, but yeah. And, um, yeah, I, de I definitely think you guys opened up a lot of people's eyes in the space for sure, because, um, you know, it'll definitely be this type of programming will definitely be integrated in a lot of things moving forward. That's for sure. Um, mm -hmm. and then also one, one point I want to touch on, you guys did a really good job in trailer of actually converting plays, um, into streams, correct? Um, correct. in the app. Uh, yeah, sorry. So the um, the Apple Music integration that we currently have built out, and uh, we're currently working on building that out with, I believe, Tidal, Deezer, and Spotify Next. Um, essentially, the way it works is um, the Apple Music button that we have integrated into the actual video that you see scrolling down your feed um, pulls the full version of the song from uh, Apple Music. Um, so outside of the actual 30-second clips that are ingested or used uh, for fans to engage with, 
Um, the videos that you're actually seeing on the feed that have the audio in the background, it's not tied directly to the stream. So you have to hit the Apple Music button to allow the full song to be streamed. And after listening to 31 seconds of that song, it counts over uh, as a stream uh, on Apple Music for the artist. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of confusion with that. I don't think we did the greatest job with really articulating, um, you know, kind of exactly how that works and even just exactly how it will work in the future. Because I, again, I think we're enhancing the tool as it be currently, but that's definitely been a, you know, a huge selling point for us to really be able to say like outside of a lot of the promotions we're doing and viral traction that we're allowing and opportunity that we're creating um, to have the streams as like that, that next final um, you know, layer of promotion to be able to say like, we can actually induce stream to the platform. I believe we coined it as a term called social streaming. Um, so we're looking to kind of, like I said, enhance that feature a little bit more, but right now I think it's just in its most basic form right now. I think we've had it actually active in the app for about three months. Yeah, that's awesome. Man. I'm really excited to see how that progresses because um, yeah, it's definitely the future in, in, in how this is, you know, playing out. All right. Awesome. Thank you, man. Uh, we're going to go over to yep. Noel. Hi. Hello. How are you? I'm great. How is this? Is I, I just like listening to this conversation because I don't know any of you guys personally um, on this feed. So it's really interesting to hear what you guys are doing. And hopefully we can continue conversations in the future because you guys are rad. Um, just to tell people who I am, um, I'm in a band called Fits of the Tantrums. I've been the co-lead singer of that band for the last 11 years. And, you know, obviously I've been able to kind of see the, the, the shaping and, and twisting of the music industry over my career, just in that band, starting off as, you know, a band that was completely independent, no funding whatsoever from any label for the first, you know, almost, I want to say like two years of our career into pivoting into an independent label called Danger Bird, which then, you know, we got bought out by Electra. So I've gone from, you know, funding ourselves to having some funding and, you know, being able to do it on a bigger scale to doing it in the uh, field that I'm in now with this band. And, you know, it's it's been interesting kind of seeing how this pandemic has slightly changed my lifestyle you know like for the most part like you i were just, have, you were just on a big tour right like yeah did you, yeah did, you so that our, did it get canceled yeah well we lucked out because our tour was just ending when everything started to get into social distancing mode so we only lost out on two gigs the thing that's kind of like you know in in the air now is what we're going to do for the rest of the year so obviously there's rescheduling that's happening um we hadn't made any announcements yet on you know what was going to happen for the rest of the year yet anyway so i think we kind of left out on that that we didn't need to have a major cancellation of anything we're just kind of you know taking it day by day and seeing what's happening and you know, the team, the teams are sending us updates um, where we have been fortunate in that, you know, like, um, sorry, I think uh, BB had mentioned sinks being up right now. Um, you know, we've, we've been fortunate to be a band that's done really, really well in the sync world. Um, and we've been seeing a lot of renewal of licenses um, in campaigns that weren't going to run again because I think advertising, you know, they're trying to capitalize on the investments that they've already made. They're not exactly sure if they're going to be able to cut new commercials or do new creative for things. So they're revisiting things that really worked. And, uh, and you know, it's honestly worked out in our favor that, you know, we've, we've done as well in the past with, with licensing and, and still continue to do so. Um, you know, because it kind of takes a little bit of the blow off of not being able to tour right now. Because right now I would actually be on the road. I'd be somewhere, you know, so that's, that's really interesting. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm such a big fan of uh, what you guys do and um, definitely have, you know, very happy to have you on here and, and being a part of this. So thank you very much. Oh, absolutely. I would say with collaboration, um, it's interesting that now the virtual space is is on the come up because I know a lot of people that had been doing them, you know, if you're like working with a producer that's out in New York and stuff like that. So I'm really looking forward to seeing the caliber of artists that come out of this. Like I, 
I feel like the songwriting game is going to step up a lot. Um, you have way more time to focus on, you know, really, really what's in your heart without somebody else's deadline. So I think that's really cool as well. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think, I think we're going to see some incredible, incredible music come out of this. I mean, we've never had this type of downtime. Um, so it's going to be really interesting to see. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Awesome. Let's go over to Justin. Um, hey guys, I'm Justin. Um, I do digital marketing and sports partnerships at Atlantic Records. Um, on the digital side of things, it's really like the full realm of all the internet stuff from advertising to influencer marketing to like creative content partnerships um, and all that good stuff down to like the like nuts and bolts of like uploading YouTube videos and making sure everything's optimized, working with partners like Triller. Um, Cam, I work with Sage all the time um, and she says you're the homie. So uh, working with them is great. Uh, Audio Mac and all those different online partners. And then on the sports side of things, figuring out ways other than the traditional like, oh, cool, let's get a song in the NBA finals or whatever. Working with, you know, new social platforms like Overtime and the Bleacher Reports of the world to see how we can get our music into that social space of things. And then also how we can get our artists in content with those partners. Uh, so, for example, like Overtime has this YouTube series called the Overtime Challenge, and A Boogie was the first ever non-athlete to do an Overtime Challenge. So, just trying to do different stuff like that. That's really dope, man. That's really dope. Um, what type of what type of advice can you give the audience as far as far as like um, you know some of the strategies you guys do as far as you know coming out, you know, launching an artist, or I know you're working on some campaigns at the moment. Yeah, I mean, the first thing is like, everybody says this, but like, you have to stay on brand. And obviously, like people will say, you know, till they're blue in the face, oh, like the label wants to like, be very generic or whatever. But for what I do, like, I want to understand my artist audience, you know, and see what like, you can really do to cater to them. I don't want to just like, have a cookie cutter template and then just like shoot everything out that way, you know, so really just figuring out what your audience reacts to and then like capitalizing on that instead of being like, oh, cool, I like this and I think this works, so I'm going to do it that way um, is really important. You know, uh, just like kind of how I got into the sports space of things, like a lot of the artists that I was working with had an affinity for that sports audience, you know, so I was doing a lot of stuff to cater to that audience as well. So really just staying organic to what your artist brand is, I think is super important. Uh, and then, you know, for super new artists, like doing all the little things, right, like making sure that you have all the links in your YouTube profile and your SoundCloud profile and like people can find you very easily because if like somebody's listening to you for the first time and they want to find out who you are and they can't find you really easily, most likely like they're going to stop and just go back to what they know. Um, so all like the little boring stuff that seems like it's not that important actually is because it helps with your discovery in the very beginning. That's really good advice. Thank you, man. Yeah. And also just like in terms of what I've been doing, like not that much has changed with the quarantine, you know, cause a lot of my stuff, you know, is online based anyway. Just the main challenge has been like a lot of times I'm shooting content and obviously like there's no offices open to go and shoot with partners or whatever. So the big challenge is really like getting on the phone with my artists and walking them through stuff. If they have to film it on their phone at home, whatever, you know, not everybody is so like technologically adept. Uh, so just figuring out ways to get all the stuff that we want filmed and out there has just been the main change, you know, since we've been in quarantine. Yeah, artists have to get really creative right now in their homes or you know, down in, this front, in front of their homes or whatever it is. I'm going to ask a question about that because, you know, um, being an artist in this field and trying to navigate all of the different platforms that can be utilized, you know, you have your Instagram live, you have Triller, you have uh, what is it, Snapchat, which I haven't used in forever, but you have all of these various platforms that can be utilized for your brand per se, but when there is such a learning curve and how you actually help those things operate and one thing, because at the end of the day, say if I'm trying to get like brand sponsorship from somebody as like an independent artist, my, my um, experience has been, is they're looking at the numbers of all of your socials. So if you have one that's way up here, but then your numbers are down here and say like Facebook or whatever it is, it's like, 
how do you navigate that as an artist one that doesn't have a full team like we don't have you in the office with us doing all the work for us most of us still have to have jobs if you know like we're working and trying to do this at the same time how do you capitalize on all of these platforms but make it easy for you to be able to do all of your content have it be consistent because one may read well on twitter but it doesn't read well on facebook or youtube you know what i'm saying so what's yeah. the uh any so info that, or advice on that um one thing like obviously all my artists are super heavy on instagram and like not none of my artists post on facebook you know so it's a lot of like repurposing content from like Instagram to Facebook and same thing with Snapchat. A lot of my artists don't have a Snapchat, you know, so we'll build out an account and just repurpose, you know, whatever content we have from other platforms. And obviously that's harder when you don't have a team to go on there and do it for you, but there's different tools that you can use to help schedule out content. Um, you know, for example, if there's an artist who like his audience reacted really well to Triller videos, you know, if he's going to go and record a Triller for a couple songs and he's going to post that on IG, I'm going to make sure that, you know, if he's not super active on Twitter or Facebook or Snapchat, that we just like repurpose that content across all of them. Cause at the end of the day, like you can still build an audience on there and not have to think about what you're going to do individually for each, if that makes sense. And so like, just to I got, piggyback off. The yeah, just to piggyback off of that, I, I actually get that question a lot from the artists that we talk with. I think even as part of my whole pitch to artists, being able to use an app like Triller, especially with being able to have, again, the licensing agreements carry over from the platform, but also just being able to take advantage of an algorithm like what the app allows you to do. So it being the fact that it matches the downbeat of the music with your movement in the video, I tell artists all the time, I think everybody's gotten really trapped and just sitting their phone down and trying to make a corny dance video for as a means of like relating to their audience. And, you know, especially for some of the artists that aren't dance oriented, or aren't even young enough to really be in the social media curve. Um, it's one of those things where I'm like, you know, repurpose the content that you have. And uh, that's everything from live concert footage, to interviews to, um, you know, just studio sessions, do an acoustic video and really just kind of like play around with the brand of you as an artist and experiment. And I tell people use Triller as a way to experiment with that because we're not going to really um, tell people if there's any type of content that doesn't belong on the platform. I think when I tell people to look at like how people treat Instagram versus how we might consume uh, content on Triller, um, you know, people look at their Instagram as their buttoned up, you know, business card, you know, it's a very clean image of yourself. Um, I, I tell people just dump your content on the Triller and mostly because there's a certain um, amount of manual curation that we do on the platform um, that kind of like I said it's really just us trying to find content that really fits our brand but I think as we've started to kind of step out of just again the organic dance challenge realm um, and really getting more people to just be more creative with how you can create content again I, I also never tell artists like don't market yourself on TikTok I, I think it's actually just a huge fan base that if you actually have content or have a brand that caters to that fan base you actually open the door for a, you know a shit ton of opportunity for yourself um, again, I think when we talk about how to get all of your social media platforms to kind of be more of a cohesive strategy, um, I kind of tell artists there's like a, a savviness that has to be taken with the approach of like, you know, um, I, I used a baby as a case study all the time. He actually taught us how to like effectively tease music through our platform. So even the ability to put out a 15 to 30 second snippet of your song that we're more than willing to promote by putting in our playlist or doing anything like that. And then from there, being able to just collect content over the course of that, say a week early, right? So if you're trying to promote a song, um, you know, a week from now and you uh, put a snippet of it on Triller and you get, you know, a thousand videos made in that first week, that was a, like, we one, we haven't been able to track exactly where that content is going once it leaves the platform. But what we do know, as far as most people have discovered Triller, it's always been off platform right so the cool thing is knowing that the content that's made on the platform it lives in the platform you can track it and see it but the exposure that's gained that we can't exactly track at the moment from just having the content made and relying on our fan base to organically share those videos outward it's increasing the awareness and the exposure for your music before it even drops right so then going into a second week right where after the song is officially released i tell artists all the time we have the apple music integration right so even allowing um your full version of your song to be streamed um, from an outside platform that's not a major DSP, right? It's really just, again, a, one more place for it to live. So I, I'm i assuming other apps are gonna start, you know, kind of falling in line with the same approach only because it, for the artists, it really is about just putting 
um, you know, your content and your music in as many places as possible. So, you know, telling people, you know, through contest uh, is a, a major one, just incentivizing your organic fan base that you have. I think a lot of our whole job with getting artists to come over from other platforms is literally just being like, any artist that's on the platform serves as a brand ambassador. The more people you guys can get to make videos to your song once it's on the platform, that's more followers, more traction for us. And the more you're able to do that for us, the more we're going to be able to do it for you. Um, so I, again, I think, and then even looking at some of the integrations, sorry, I meant to mention that as well. We're actually coming out with a Snapchat integration um, within the next couple months, I believe. Um, and essentially, I think the first wave of it is just allowing your Snap stories to live on Triller, right? So essentially, you go into your Triller file, profile, hit the profile image, and your Snap story opens up. From there, I look at it as being able to say, if you can tease a video or tease your video in your song on Instagram, let people know it's in Triller, right? Have it drop on a major DSP. Um, do promo content through Snapchat, have it live on Triller, start uh, introducing the idea of a music video dropping on YouTube, right? Come and create like a, a rabbit hole for your followers to kind of go and find your content in different places. And that's how I've been trying to get it to all connect. How artists do that is completely up to them. And I like to just leave that level of creative freedom for them to navigate that. But essentially, I think that's how most people are starting to really, especially the kids, these 17 and 18 year old kids just inherently know how to do this but that's essentially what i'm seeing they're just able to leave little treats for people and again get influencers involved and kind of get more hype and build up around the song even before it initially drops just to induce more traction on the day of uh release sorry that was a lot but no that was that was amazing thank <laughs> that you was great, man. that was great <laughs> that was great <laughs> both of you yeah let's um yeah, that's thanks. awesome thank you guys uh let's move over to skyler um and then we'll do some q and a's from the uh from the chat um Skylar, how are you, man? Congrats on um, your recent work with Dua Lipa. Um, I Thank know you. The album just went number one in the UK, so that's that's really awesome. Appreciate it, um, guys. I've been I've been taking this time uh, to look up what everyone's doing. I've honestly never even heard of Triller, and I try to stay on top of this. This is amazing. <laughs> this is uh this is this is pretty interesting. I got so many questions about like just uh, like a bunch of this stuff, but um. Yeah, guys, it's it's great to be here and it's great to talk with everyone. Uh, uh, I am a music producer, songwriter, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I work out here in Hollywood, California, um, kind of like a, a gun for hire. I don't really have a music project to myself. I get hired out by uh, by labels to work with different artists. I know a bunch of artists. Um, I've started a few artists launched some people got them signed worked on their projects um yeah i'm i'm the uh i'm the music guy i'm not the tech guy <laughs> but everybody in here makes what i do worth something so thank you and uh how how have you been um you know i know how have you been kind of collaborating right now you've been staying busy um you're still you know doing packs or sending beats out or we're doing writing sessions like what's been uh what's been your um it took me a while to adjust to be honest like my personal style my hustle out here is that i'm in the streets and i i meet people when they're coming up i'm in the studios i'll usually get called over from some friends or i'll go out to clubs or you know really whatever like i'll try to find out what's next and just being social out here and I mean, as of up to around last month, that was the best way that I found out um, about what was, you know, what was, what was cool. And just like, what was next, you know, was, I mean, Hollywood, Hollywood is like definitely, you know, where everybody goes when they outgrow wherever they're from. And so I would mostly find people that had just outgrew their own settings and came out here. And, you know, some of those people were amazing, you know, and so this has been kind of a big adjustment for me personally. I do not usually like stay inside like that. Um, even working in studios, I would try to like bounce around. I would bounce around town even for just one song. I would do it at maybe like two or three studios just to just to, you know, hear different different takes on the record or just to stay moving and just keep my mind active and stuff so it's been kind of an adjustment but 
there's things like this that are popping up and um and then me and a bunch of my buddies are in this producer group so i've been you know it's kind of like david was saying like i've met a lot of people that i've known peripher peripherally i don't know if that's the right word but I'm, I'm meeting a lot of people and actually getting to know them and I've heard their names for years, but I've just never really known them. I've never had any interactions with them. And now I'm like on these, you know, on these types of Zooms or, you know, like 10 way chats with these people and I'm getting to know like all the other producers. And this has been really cool. Like yesterday, I've, me and me and a group of producers are, you know, there's like 15 of us on this chat and we all split up in groups of three and we're all like producing one track. And, you know, um, one of the guys I'm working with is going in with Normani another one's going in with, you know, X, Y, Z. And like, we all just kind of like pass the tracks around and say like, yo, this would be cool. Some of the people also write. Um, I'm a writer as well. So I mean like people just send me the tracks, even if I had nothing to do with it, and I'll come up with some concepts. So it, it has, long answer to a short question it has been a very big transition but um but i'm getting into the flow of it now and also my management has been super helpful they're still, they're still like working hard and pitching and you and know you're, it's you're great to have a team neil, right? right now you work with neil yeah oh. yeah 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 neil jacobson is my manager and uh timmy hale helps him out a lot and yeah i mean the squad having a squad right now is everything yeah big 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 help so um yeah um that's uh that's that's pretty much for me what well, um did i miss anything no that's it man that was great um, okay yeah we're gonna we're gonna we have a few minutes left um like five ten minutes so we're gonna take some questions from the chat from the q a so tony if you want to read some off of the sure the yeah panelists and un unmute everyone please there is a uh let's see there's a question here that rebecca actually answered but let's get a little discussion on it um this is from tarek saleh um it says what are your views and takes on paid advertising on social platforms and how effective it is for getting artists seen by new and relevant people around the world what is your experience with paid advertising when trying to break a, a song and, or a visual for an artist can you unmute justin tony please yeah where's uh uh, I, I I kept myself muted in case anybody. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Cool. Cool. Um. Yeah. I mean, Justin, do you have any take on that? Yeah. Um. So paid paid social is interesting. Uh. In terms of like strictly metrics, like we've done a lot of digging into it, and we've never really seen that like advertising strictly has helped streaming spike for a song or like really driven an artist social growth, like just like off paid social alone. It's more so something that'll help. Like there's a general downward trajectory on tracks, like after release and it'll help flatten that out, uh, but not necessarily grow it. I think that when you're like super, super up, up and coming paid social, isn't necessarily the way there's better ways to spend your money and get more organic exposure. Uh, just cause like, you know, general, in general, people like when they're scrolling through and they see the sponsored ads, like a lot of times, um, like you're not going to get a lot of retention off of that if there's no real like recognition right off the bat. So I'd say like, I usually start off on paid social when my artist has like started to open up on a tour, obviously like there's no touring going on right now, but let's say like an artist has a big feature or even like a medium sized feature or whatever, where there's a little bit of recognition, then you know, you can go and do some paid social and there's going to be some retention because people have seen the name before and they're more likely to be like, okay, cool. I haven't begun on this yet, but like, let me go check it out. Yeah. That sounds, that. sounds about right. Mm -hmm. um, does anyone else have uh, anything to add there or? I, I actually have a question. If you wouldn't do paid social to launch something, what would you suggest? Um, so I think it, it varies like project by project. Uh, you know, I work a lot in the urban space, so instead of paid social, like, I'm going to a lot of the hip-hop networks, you know, like, the academics of the world and, like, those different networks where our fans are living and getting exposure for our artists on there, you know, instead of running an ad that comes across as just a sponsored post. 
you know and even when you when it comes to that there's got to be a little bit of thoughtfulness put to it because like fans are very easy to sniff out like okay cool that's just paid for like fuck that um excuse my language i don't know if i can curse on here or not but yeah, we um, can curse and we allow dogs in the webinar too yeah. so thank <laughs> you rebecca <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, so it's just like kind of each one of those platforms has their own ecosystem and a way to kind of work your artists in there organically in a way where the fans feel like they're discovering it because of the platform and not like because we shoved it in their face, you know, so whether it's like, cool, I'm rolling out a single, the single drops next week, I'm going to feed them a clip of the artist previewing the track in the studio you know, that they put up on IG Live and they're going to post that. Then the artist is going to put up the single art. You know, we're going to have them post like, oh, yo, such and such just posted the single art. Um, then the track comes out, like post about the track being out and then figure out what other, you know, piece of social content we have for that as well. Um, you know, like I'm not going to send them like the little animated art trailer that we made in-house, you know, or anything like that when a track is out, like I'm going to send them the artist listening to the song or like if there's a music video for it, uh, we're going to use the music video just make sure that everything feels really real um you know as opposed to something that's getting shoved in somebody's face i got i got one more question if everyone's okay with that and it goes to it goes to you and cameron is that cool yeah shoot let's go okay um so i a lot of the things that i've been hearing lately uh as far as like you know with quarantine being where we all are and everything Everyone's talking about doing concerts and doing club venues and stuff on VR headsets. Now, for me, as somebody that used to go out and, and do all that stuff, it sounds kind of goofy, but it also sounds somewhat realistic. And um, I think that the reason why I've thought about this a lot, I think the reason why this works in terms of sports venues and things that are recorded and you know, basically can be streamed at any point. But the reason why people tune in and they'll, they'll do a pay, uh, they'll do like a pay-per-view for an HBO fight or they'll do a, you know, they'll, they'll watch the game. Do we get, what happened? Rebecca had to jump off her call. It's all good. <laughs> oh. No, no. So, so like for, for, do you guys see any type of urgency being generated to the point where an artist would jump on a platform, um, be it YouTube, Triller, any of these, any of these types of platforms where people would be inclined to tune in that day. So I think that in terms of like VR, and, it, and, and is that something that the label was trying to do? Uh, like, general, is that is that the conversations you guys are having? So in general, like VR has been like a tricky space to navigate. Um, you know, we've been trying to figure it out for like literally years. Um, one of the problems is that like the barrier of entry is so high, you know, like in order to actually participate in VR, you, most of the time, like you'll need a 300 or more dollar headset, um, you know, and all this equipment. And even then, like, it's not really something that you can do together with your friends um, per se, you know, so it's been really tough. Even some of like the coolest things that we've done in the VR space haven't gained you know, a whole ton of viewers just because there's, it's not like readily accessible to the general public. Um, you know, especially the music that I work with, a lot of our demographic and our fans are not the fans who can go out and spend $300 on a VR headset, you know? Right. Um, and there was, there was uh, one of the artists that a colleague of mine worked on, uh, Galantis, you know, they did this super, super dope VR concert um, I forgot like the exact concept around it, but I remember like they pulled it off flawlessly, like the marketing around it was great. And still like the viewership was kind of like diminutive. So, you know, VR, I think is tough still, um, especially right now when people like definitely can't afford new shit. Uh, but in terms of like live stream stuff, stuff like the Triller Fest that they did, that's definitely something that we're looking to more yeah. and more. And on my end, when I'm looking into opportunities like that, it's got to be something where like my artists can shine, like not just like, okay, cool, here's an opportunity, let's do it because there's not that much going on right now. Like if you're the type of artist who is not like, a lot of your performance comes from the energy and not necessarily because you have a voice as strong as Noel's, you know, maybe a live stream isn't the best thing for you to do because it's not, it's not going to come across the right way. Um, yeah, so I, I agree. I think you need to be like really picky right now because 
this live streaming, obviously, you know, we've been talking about it the last few weeks. It's been going on in the esports world for years. But now that it's into the music world and, and everyone's adapting into it so quickly, it's also not being first to market too um, when it comes to to the live stream thing as an artist and being really picky and you know live streaming from your bedroom might not be the the best look for some artists. So you know, I will say though the whole Tory Lane thing still blows my mind because I know his quarantine radio just spiked his sales for this last album. I even I bought oh, a yeah. shirt no, on it's, Instagram like it's, it's so, a, yeah is <laughs> for sure it's the future it's yeah. now. Um, and then obviously when it goes back to, to Skylar, you know, 5G is going to be a big factor in the development of, of VR and the adaption of it. Um, I know a lot of people are hating on 5G right now, but those are just the facts. Hmm. That's just the reality. Those are the hard facts of when 5G does come. Um, a yeah. lot of things are going to improve drastically and I'm sure we'll see a shift. Um, but um, Do you guys, and for you guys in the chat, you guys would actually put on a VR headset and go to a concert. Me everybody in the chat probably wouldn't. if Daft oh. Punk did it if that if Daft Punk did some shit on VR like I'd probably tune in with a headset. Everybody else, you have to go and person. put on. Yeah, a I think I I think it comes down to who the artist is, you yeah. know, and then like who's able to actually, like Justin said, actually participate in it. If it got to a point where everybody could afford to do it in this way and still have the same experience as those who can afford the $300 headset or whatever. And then, I mean, I mean, we've shot those, you know, like not VR, but maybe the, I guess they are VR, the 3D concert things. We have your eyeglasses on. I don't know yeah. what those things are called, <laughs> but we've done that before. And I've actually gotten to experience watching myself perform on stage. I think it was Oculus. Is that the name of the company that does yeah. that? Anyway, but I've, I've been able to do that. And it's a really cool experience if it's something that you can pull off that goes in tandem with a concert that you're already doing live. I think that's, for me right now, what I'm seeing happening is, is people, like older people, say like my mom, they're learning how to use live streaming now. Like they're learning how to use the FaceTimes and the Zooms and all of these things. So it's going to be awesome to be able to bring that live streaming element into a concert. So then when my parents in LA, they can watch me perform in Cleveland. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, I feel like maybe that's going to be the next jump. Like, I think people are going to fine tune it and make it, you know, better for audio or make the experience more personable because at the end of the day, even if you're on here live streaming, you still have to engage with the audience. Like you still have to be able to say, Hey, Bonnie, I see you out there. You know, it's like, right, one of the things, right. you know, it's like one of the things that I've loved about watching the nice. And I, and I think like for me, the live streaming thing for the DJs, they're having the most fun. Like it's a lot harder to do it on the acoustic, you know, unless you're just like really close and you got a great mic for you to be able to kind of have that, that same impact and that same energy. I think DJs are really, really doing the live streaming thing well because you can engage with the audience. Like you can, you know, what up, Samantha? I see you out there. People love that shit. You can't do that yeah. shit when you're singing. You know what I'm saying? Like you can do it after, <laughs> but it's, <laughs> it's very hard to like engage. And I think like once we're able to figure out a way of make it engaging for people that are sitting at home watching, like make it as Beyonce as her Coachella life thing and, mm -hmm. you know, get people excited about it. then I think it's something that, you know, we're not going to be able to not do. Like it's going to have to be a part of the the cycle. Absolutely. Right. Right. Let's do, um, let's do one more question and then we could wrap this up. Um, there's a question here for David. Where are you discovering artists mostly today? Um, day and night is one of my favorite projects of all time. Um, well, whoever said that's one of your favorite projects of all time. Frank, no. Frank, Thank shout you. out, bro. Hell yeah. That project was fire. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so so today where am I discovering um, I basically have a network of like really young kids between the age of like 20 and 23 um, at like multiple colleges across the country that email me to do internships at my label and then I 
do like a, I have like a routine of like a two minute interview where I can like decipher whether this person is worth it for me to send me shit or not send me shit based on like a playlist. So I just give people opportunities and then I build with those young kids um, and like gauge their taste. Like we, we just, for example, we just signed a kid named Mind Chatter that we put out last week. Um, I love him. He used oh, to work at that same studio. May, I don't know, actually. He, he's in New York, so maybe. But um, he's, he came he's out cool. last week. He's, he's amazing. We got like a bunch of playlisting and support and he's going to be dope. But for example, with him, there was a kid that was interning for me that was like, yo, my girlfriend just played this song. What do you think? And I heard like three seconds in and I was like, okay, this kid's got it. So um, I discover music to answer your question, mainly through people sending me stuff. Um, I, I try to like, I try to encourage people instead of sending like 20 artists at one time, send like the top three because like there's so much saturation. So you have to be like super unique to be able to cut through the noise today, especially as a new artist. And I prefer if the act has some sort of marketing sensibility, um, like they, they know what it means to have a consistent brand. Like I don't need to educate them on that or they know what it means to have good artwork or they know what it means to like engage. Um, so they have to have that vision too, but um, yeah, that's, that's sort of how I find stuff now. There's no rhyme or reason, but I, I just, you know, music consumption for the most part is a young audience. So you have to have people that are like really in it um, and, and consume themselves. Cause I can find a bunch of stuff that I think is dope, but like what I think is dope today is like jazz and like trip hop. And like, I don't listen to anything that's like really that new unless someone like tips me to it. Cause I'm just not living the life that kids are. So I don't, I don't like associate myself with the same things that most like new artists talk about most of the time, unless it's really compelling. And then I'm like, yeah, I got to sign this. But most shit that pops off on like, you know, really quick ways just thematically doesn't resonate. I'm 30 now. So um, I have to have my ears to the ground in a different way. And I do that by just having like a lesion of young kids that like feed me stuff on a pretty consistent basis. I will say this, that um, uh, an experience I had is working with creative directors, especially if you're, you know, one of those artists that are still trying to figure out what your brand is and organically figure it out. Um, creative directors have been very, very helpful and and shaping and molding and helping you put out the right content and, you know, sharing your story in a very authentic way, but also doing it in a way that, you know, can collect those clicks. Um, I'd, I'd love to see more record labels, you know, uh, use, utilizing that in tandem with publicists, you know, because for the most part, if you're, you know, a publicist at the record label, you're not necessarily always looking at the artist itself. You're looking at the grand scheme of how you want it to be sold from the corporate side of things. Um, sure. And I think, you know, I think it's really helpful to have, you know, somebody that is really, really focused on what is this artist's narrative and how can we best capitalize on this in all of these, you know, all of these categories from their social media down to, if we're using a website, what that website's gonna look like. Are people actually even using websites anymore outside of just buying merch? What should the merch store look like? Every single part of you know, the brand consistency can be helped with having somebody that is you know, that outside party that is you know, really definitively looking out for the artist in that creative space, making the marketer's job that much easier. Yeah, I just wanna say like, I could not agree more with her, like every time I've worked with an artist as a really dope creative director, it's made the process so much more seamless and it's made everything come off so much better. So yeah, that's a great point. I agree. Okay, awesome guys. Well, thank you everybody so much for being a part of this webinar, episode three, Jam Compass. Um, really excited to be launching the app um, in beta within the next few months. I mean, we're on calls every week with our development team, making tweaks and getting everything built. So. Um, we really appreciate you guys being on here. Your knowledge for the audience has been incredible. Um, people are very appreciative to hear, um, you know, right from the source. So this has been awesome. Thank you guys very much.
And I'd uh, love to stay connected with all of you if it's okay if I uh, hound the sorrow yeah, for your yeah, info. Yeah, I'll send you a spam I'll, email. I, anyone that wants to be connected, <laughs> hit me up and I will connect everybody. No yeah. problem. Yeah, I love that. Sure. And uh, yeah, right, yeah, I love that. Thank you so much. Nice to meet you guys. Hey, Dustin, Cam, yeah. Noel, Skyler, sure, yeah, man. Rebecca, thank hey, you. Bye. Bye. Thank you for that. putting Have this together. Yeah, all yes. the time. Yes. 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 <laughs> We'll be uh, we'll be putting it on YouTube uh, either tonight or tomorrow morning, um, cutting it up with clips. So be on the lookout for that. And uh, everyone, join our Slack channel. Um, the link is in the chat. That's where everyone can kind of stay connected and and also you know see what opportunities can come about. And then once the app is ready, we'll be shifting everything over. So thank you guys so much. Take care. All right, bye guys.